ladies and gentlemen, here in Brussels and wherever you watch us from around the world in the streaming, I welcome you to this conference, uh, which is organized uh, within the framework global universities of civis uh, welcomes uh, members of the community organize conferences, meetings, and many other events. The circumstances of the pandemic uh, forced us last year to move the Global Civis Days entirely online. This year, we're happy that we could save some of the events uh, and uh, organize as much blended format as we could. And so we're extremely pleased, uh, both symbolically and intellectually, uh, to be able to organize this conference tonight. The Global Civis Days are organized by uh, ULB this year, but also co-organized with uh, the University of Glasgow and the uh, Universita Autonoma de Madrid, and I thank them for their support. Uh, I'm not going to lecture you about CIVIS and the European University, but um, I, I will tell you uh, to make sure that everyone is on the same page that European universities have been created uh, only a little bit over two years ago. ULB is part of CIVIS, one of the 17 pioneers European universities of the first call, the pilot phase that we have inaugurated will end in less than a year, and we are confident that CIVIS and its 10 member universities are uh, on their way to uh, make CIVIS something which will last and grow and change the way higher education uh, is organized in Europe. Tonight, we are very lucky to have with us five speakers. We have two students, uh, Lucas Portugals, who is a student here at ULB, student in economics, we have Julia Tiloetes, who is a student uh, in law and political science at Universita Autonoma de Madrid. We also have two rectors, or rather one rector, uh, Am Amaya Mendicoyetea, who is rector of Universita Autonoma de Madrid. And um, Anton Muscatelli, who is, I mean, Within CIVIS, we call every head of institution rectors because it's so much simpler. But Anton Muscatelli happens to be principal and vice chancellor of the University of Glasgow. And our uh, keynote speaker tonight uh, is Paul Magnet. And our uh, keynote speaker tonight uh, is Paul Magnet. Many of many of many of you know Paul Magnet uh, because uh, is uh, someone who was so active here at ULB. He was a professor of political science and European studies, and uh, everyone knew him because he was um, so active and so um, um, uh, entrepreneurial um, back then. And at some point in his career, Paul, who uh, has very uh, strong ideas about civic engagement, mm -hmm. uh, decided to get uh, um, deeply involved in, um, um, in, in civic uh, engagement in the political life of this country, um, um, in civic uh, engagement in the political life of this country. And uh, he has been so successful in doing that, that uh, he, uh, although we still think of him as a colleague and a professor of political science, he is now mayor of Charleroi, who's the largest city in Wallonia. He is also the president of the Socialist Party, uh, which is the largest political party uh, in Wallonia. He's the former minister president of Wallonia. Uh, and with his background in political science and European studies, he is the perfect speaker for this main conference of the Global Civis Days because he will be able to articulate uh, the, the future of higher education, the role of Europe, the European construction, and the connection between universities and the regions and the cities. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Paul. When he is finished with his talk, I will then uh, take the stage back to um, uh, give the floor to all other four speakers who will, uh, in a free format, respond to Paul and have a conversation. Uh, if time allows, and I hope it will, then there will be time for reactions, questions from the audience. Paul, if you please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois, uh, for this very kind introduction. Thank you, dear rectors, vice rectors, chancellors, presidents, deans, vice deans, <laughs> colleagues, dear students. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you to ask me to say a few words. Uh, 
about not just European cooperation between universities, but also how universities should combine more European integration, more integration at transnational level, and also try to keep rooted in their uh, territories and uh, make sure that they keep contributing to uh, the, the life of the community in which they were born. The question when, when I was, I'm trying to work on this, but it, it will, it's okay, when I'm, it, it's coming. There's a slight delay between the moment when I press the button and when the picture comes, so I have to uh, take care of this. So I, I was asked when Anna, the Vice Rector in charge of international relations of the ULB, asked me to say a few words. Of course, I cannot refuse, because Anne is, uh, has been a friend for the last 20 years or 25 years, or maybe even 30 years, I don't remember. Uh, but so I, I, I cannot say no by definition. But um, I said yes without thinking, what will I say about those issues of uh, bridging European integration and local roots? But she, she said to me, but well, you're an academic, you are specialized in European issues, you're a mayor, so you're the perfect person to do that. So I could not say no. But then. I started thinking about it and I said, well, it's not so, I mean, it's on the one hand so obvious that universities should strengthen their European integration and bridge it with local roads in the same times. And on the other hand, yes, why should they do that and how should they do that? And to try and find some answer about those issues, I came back to, you remember that you, of course, recognize that person, that's Erasmus, the great Dutch, but nearly Belgian philosopher, uh, chosen by the European Union, a symbol of, integral, of integration between universities and between students. And why, has, why, why was it chosen by, Euro, by European institutions as a symbol of those programs? Of course, obviously, because he is a great philosopher of this great period of the European Renaissance, uh, 16th century writer of beautiful books, this beautiful praise for madness, Eloge de la Folie, uh, which remains one of the greatest works of that time, but also because, very probably, Erasmus was a great traveler, as all academics of the time were. We see on this map all the, the, main, travel, the main travels of Erasmus on his 40 years long uh, career as an academic. He was born in the Netherlands, very uh, close he came to, what did he start? He came to Antwerp, Brussels, or something like that. He went to Oxford, then moved to Paris, then went south to Lyon, Milano, Pavia, Bologna, Firenze, Roma, went back to north, Padova, Venezia, then to Switzerland, Germany, back to Louvain, and then back again to Germany, Switzerland, and he finally died in uh, 1536 in Basel. What a beautiful life. I'd love to move every two years, and especially in, in this region. And the fact that Erasmus traveled is, of course, linked to the fact that universities, by definition, were European. The first universities could not be thought as national. They emerged before the nations and before the nation states. And they were an expression of the, the very first elements of this the, the, uh, of the of the birth of the European uh, of the European identity, and an academic at that time, but also a student, could not think of staying at the same place for all his career. By definition, being an academic meant moving and moving all around Europe, and especially in the core of what Europe was at that time. And in the same time, those universities. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time, next. Okay. Those universities were not just places where academics taught, but also the core of the birth and the strengthening of the most important cities in this backbone of the European continent. This is another map showing not universities, although you can see some of them, but showing the most important place of trade around Europe at that time. And you see the maritime routes from the, from the east, from China and the Middle East to Venezia, Genova. You see the shorter maritime routes from the north of the Baltic Sea to Bruges and Gand and Antwerp and then to Spain and back to Marsiglia, Barcelona and, and Genova. So the routes on the sea were very important elements of the construction of uh, this continent, which is deeply influenced by the internal sea of the Mediterranean, as Fernand Brodel has so brilliantly shown. But 
as Baudet also demonstrated. The Mediterranean created the first cities in Italy, around the, the heavens of Genova and Venezia, and then through the, the network of cities in the center of Europe, this civilization which was born on the Mediterranean when became a European civilization. And it could only become a European civilization through the extension of urban life. And urban life, of course, was deeply rooted to and deeply connected to trade. This was demonstrated by another very famous Belgian historian, Henri Pirenne, who showed that the core of European integration was this network of cities in the center of the continent, which was the connection between the two big heavens, the northern and the southern uh, heavens of Europe, and the trade route, which went from the north of Italy through Lyon and the Champagne, and then to, and then to the Flanders and to the region uh, where we are uh, tonight. And this was also, of course, the same place as the place where the cities were built and the place where Erasmus and many other uh, philosophers and scientists and lawyers and doctors of, of the Renaissance traveled at that time. And this shows that the birth of cities connected, of course, to trade and economic activity and the genesis of capitalism and universities were linked from the very beginning. And you cannot think of cities without universities, and you cannot think of universities without uh, cities. What we sometimes underestimate, I'm afraid, is the fact that this genesis of cities on the one hand and universities on the other hand has had a very deep impact on the longue durée of European uh, history. This is a map showing the most important cities in, in Europe. In blue, those who, which are in so-called transi uh, structural transition or least developed. Orange, the medium uh, regional centers, with some of them very innovative, and red, those which are the most important metropolitan areas on, on the European continent. What is striking, again, is that, of course, the urban phenomenon has spread all over the European co continent compared to the birth of the first uh, cities at, in the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. But what is also striking is that the biggest concentration, you see those red with a black point uh, inside, and, and the orange one remain in this area where the urban factor was born, where trade and universities and cities were born uh, less uh, concerned by uh, this uh, genesis and growth of the cities on, uh, on this continent. And so the connection with university, trade and cities deeply influenced the way Europe was populated, Europe was reorganized until our time. It is also very striking when we look at the distribution of GDP, so the richness, although GDP is a very imperfect instrument, it remains the most widespread instrument uh, nowadays, to see the impact of also this genesis of European integration, the genesis of Europe as, of, as civilization, there again on the long-term trend of economic development. It is also in this same area where Erasmus traveled 500 years ago that the strongest concentration of richness remains. And the UK is now outside, sorry for our British friends, sorry Mr. Rector from Glasgow, and sorry, that due to Brexit, British is outside of the map, but if, if we had Britain on, on the map, we would see that there again, the Great London and the Southeast area would be one of the richest uh, part of Europe in the continuity of the history of the birth of the Oxford, Cambridge, uh, and the London universities uh, of the time. So is this a pure correlation is this just by chance, or are there good reasons to think that the birth of cities, the birth of universities, and the connection with, with trade have produced those long-term effects and long-term effects of stratification on the European continent? I don't think so. We all know the functions of universities, and we all know the impact they can have on their, not just immediate, but regional uh, territory. Universities tend to produce lots of research which can uh, uh, support the genesis of uh, startups and spin-offs and, uh, and support the, uh, the development of the economy. They have a very important social economic impact, but sometimes at the expense of the rest of the continent, because by definition they produce a kind of a process of cluster and geographical accumulation around the clusters that they, that they built. Look at Look here in Belgium, for example, at Louvain-la-Neuve. We were right in the middle of nowhere uh, 40 years ago. They 
the decision was taken to build a university there, and it is nowadays one of the highest concentration of biotech right in the middle of nowhere, just because the decision was taken 40 years ago to create or to move a part of the University of Louvain uh, to that place. So yes, the economic impact of uh, universities do have an, a very deep influence on the economic and social territorialization. The same holds true as far as the population is concerned, and in terms of demography. Universities, by definition, like at the time of Erasmus, have always attracted many students coming from very different territories, and very often the most brilliant or the most privileged students from sometimes very remote area move from this small, tiny city which do not have the chance to have a university to the big cities which host a university. And so they contribute to to, to raise the average level of human capital, but there again, with an impact on the stratification of those uh, territories. And we might even wonder if, because I'm a political scientist, so I always come back to, to politics and to political science, if beyond the socio-demographic and beyond the economic influence of this structuration of the continent, it cannot be also considered as having a political impact. This is, oh, sorry. this is the cover of a very, very successful uh, book in Britain, The Road to Somewhere, written by he's a kind of a social scientist and journalist, a very hybrid uh, personality, but a very brilliant book. In this book, David Goodhart uh, studies the, what he calls the populist revolt, uh, not just in Britain, but in many European, in Britain, in the US, and in the rest of Europe. And his thesis, which has become very, very... Uh, uh, famous and very popular is that we what we see today is, is the confrontation, the subdivision of the society into two big tribes, what he calls the anywheres and the somewheres. The somewheres, uh, the anywhere, the somewheres are those people who live in a given place and who are deeply rooted in the place where they live, who do not easily move from the place where they live. And he showed very convincing statistics that people tend to live very close to the place where they were, bo where they were born and very close to where their parents live. And the anywheres are people who can move and who, like Erasmus, can change from country to country and move, and, or even remaining in their own country, moving from the small, tiny city to a biggest one, uh, to a bigger one, when they have more opportunities to uh, develop their faculties. And based on this very simple issue of where people live and how they move from the place where they were born or where of if they stay in the place where they were born he develops a broader theory using lots of uh, lots of other data and shows that we have a sort of a political stratification between these two tribes the anywheres are those people who have had the chance to study at university and have a very usually high level highly educated they move very easily. They see globalization as a, very, as a perfect opportunity to, uh, to use all their um, capacities. They are in favor of European integration. In Britain, they suddenly were on the remain side and not on the, on the leave side. Uh, they, they, are, they have very open-minded uh, uh, opinions on cultural issues such as multiculturalism and that kind of things. So they are very, very tolerant in terms of mor moral values. They look like the uh, post-materialist uh, people identified by Ronald Engelhardt in his studies uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And the uh, somewheres are those who are less educated, who do not move, who fear globalization, who see European integration as a danger more than an opportunity, and who are very often less uh, tolerant in terms of uh, gender, race, uh, cultural, and that kind of, uh, of that kind of issues. Of course, it's a simplification, but it's also very interesting because this kind of simplification, this this kind of uh, typology, can be used by geographers and political scientists who can try and check whether this is correct or not. And I would like to move to the next slide, showing the map of Brexit, uh, a map made by a Swiss geographer called Jack Levy, who is one of the, one, one of the biggest specialists of what he calls uh, territorial justice. How can we analyze inequalities in relation with the territorialization of the population and of the activities, and also uh, in very uh, always more in terms of uh, politicization? 
And that's, this is a map of the results of, uh, the, uh, of the Brexit referendum in Britain, which of course is not a perfect uh, reproduction of the map of Britain because it takes into consideration the size of the population so we see better uh, what's the real political weight and demographic weight of these different sub-regions. And what do we see? Well, we see very simply that with the exception of Scotland, and that's a long story, but maybe the director of Glasgow can tell us a bit more about, about Scotland. Uh, but for the rest, we see that ver the very wide majority of the people living in those urbanized, culturally, multicultural, open-minded, uh, highly educated parts of the territory, and not just the big metropolis, because the big metropolis, of course, have a very mixed population, have voted remain, while all those who live in territories which are considered as segregated or second-rank uh, territories have voted uh, Brexit. If it were only Britain, well, we could say, well, that's a typically British phenomenon, and that's it. But when we compare it to other uh, political results, we see that this tends to be this polarization between the anywheres and the nowheres, between the more educated, more open, um, more pro-globalization and pro-integration and those who have the country on, on the other side, is something which is a long-term trend. It's been with us for the last 40 years at least, and which is always uh, strengthened. This is a map of the result of the Maastricht uh, referendum in, Brit in, in France sorry, in 1992, so 30 years ago. And there again, Jacques Lévy shows that we see exactly the same thing. The people who voted for Maastricht Treaty are the population of all the big uh, metropolitan areas. Not just Paris, but also Strasbourg, Grenoble, Lyon, Toulouse, Bordeaux, uh, the eastern part, and so on and so forth. And the people who voted no, and who were a majority, all live, most of them live in those areas which do not have a metropolitan area and a, a more open-minded and uh, cosmopolitan uh, population, if we can say uh, it so. And it lasts, because when we compare those two maps, we can think that just only the colors change. But in reality, this is the, the map showing the results of the uh, 2012 elections and the votes in favor of extreme right candidate Marine Le Pen. And there again, we see that we have nearly exactly the same kind of results. And the same holds true for the US. When we compare that sort of results with the, the elections, the results of the last elections uh, in the US, which is maybe the, the most striking uh, case in terms of uh, territorial, uh, territorialization of those, uh, of those social uh, features of, of the population, we see that those who voted for Biden, for Democrats, are living in those big metropolitan areas on the eastern and western coast mainly, and those who voted Trump live in the small cities and in the remote areas in what the Americans call the flyover America, so to say. I think, of course, universities are not responsible for all that, and, and I hope uh, you uh, you, you don't think that the conclusion that I will draw is that this is the fault of universities. But nevertheless, universities are part of this reality. Because this long-term trend of the building of cities, metropolitan areas, and knowledge and the diffusion of knowledge is deeply related to the existing socio-economic stratification of European territories. Yes, universities are part of the picture. They're not the, the, the major cause, but they're part of the picture. So this means that when we think of European integration on the one hand and local roots on the other hand, talking of universities, we should bear this in mind. And we should think, yes, we have to strengthen European integration, but bearing in mind that uh, some, that, if I'm not forgetting those kind of maps, if I can go back, And that, and civis is a very good example in this respect, that yes, it's good to, to be concentrated in the historical areas of where the, 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 the oldest European integration were built more than a thou thousand years ago, but it's also very important to f not to forget that the rest of the European continent is also uh, very important and there remains a lot to be done uh, to guarantee some kind of a territorial balance. And I try to come back to page one to show that civis is a very good example in this respect. Because yes, the maps shows that there's a very good geographical balance on the European continent, and that some of those universities are at the historical center of uh, European integration and the core of, uh, which remains the core and the, 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 the most important uh, 
uh, economic engine of uh, Europe today, but that you also have uh, universities which are on the north, on the south, on the east, on, 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 the, on, the, on all uh, parts of Europe. And so this is integrated, I hope, at least in the uh, perception of, uh, of the role of the, of, uh, the network. This being said, beyond this, I think we cannot forget that kind of maps. And we cannot forget that if we do not manage to change this, to make sure that the polarization, which is at play nowadays, can be, at some point, uh, corrected, the polarization might become very, very dangerous for the coherence of our societies. No society can live with such a deep, deep, deep confrontation between different areas and between different categories of populations who have completely different visions of what the society is, of what the values of the society should be, of, of how the, the, the country should be integrated in its, in its continent and in, in, in the world globally. Uh, if the opinions on that kind of very existential issues diverge very, very, very deeply, it can become very, uh, uh, very dangerous for a country. And the story of the Brexit, I think, unfortunately, is one of the examples, those tendencies in, in the long run. Of course, universities alone cannot change this and cannot, uh, cannot uh, curb that, that, that trend and, and go to a completely uh, different uh, orientation. But then they nevertheless have a role to play, I think. They have a role to play by when they build uh, networks as you do, trying to be as balanced as possible on the European continent. And congratulations for this. They might have a role to play also in trying to think of the kind of connections they can build with the rest of the territory. And this is a long-term uh, discussion between ULB and my city, uh, Charleroi, one of the regions why we try to strengthen the cooperation between the University of Brussels here in the heart of Europe and a city which is not very remote, 60 kilometers away, but which is one of those leftover areas, uh, post-industrial cities with all the economic and social uh, consequences that you, that you can imagine, that yes, universities have a responsibility beyond the direct local environment of their uh, localization and also f farther on this territory. Uh, that's, I think, one thing that should uh, be borne in mind. A second thing that I think we should keep having in mind is that universities and are only one part of what we call higher education. Yet, in most European countries, the cooperation between universities on the, on, on the one hand and the rest of higher education on the other hand remains very limited. And the fact that between arts faculties, between uh, higher school, high schools, which are not universities, and the cooperation, uh, and the fact that the students can move from one to the other, uh, remains very limited on, in the European model of uh, construction of higher education. And this is also probably one of the reasons why we have that kind of stratification. If you live in a small city, you might find a high school, but this high school will very, uh, very often not lead you to a university. And more cooperation between the different components of the higher of the world of higher education might also be one of the options to try and uh, and avoid uh, uh, deep radicalization of that kind of uh, territorial polarization last and to conclude maybe should also universities keep in mind that in in the time of uh, aristotle universities were not thought of as a local of as localized places at the time of peripatetics by definition the, pr the the professors were moving were walking with the students were moving from one city to 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 the other they were not thought of as place as as places as localized places and of course it's important for a university to have roots to have buildings to have even its city in the city uh, very often but it's also very important that they do not forget that they are uh, immaterial, uh, intellectual, cultural institutions and not just, uh, not just material institution, and that as such they have this responsibility to try and keep uh, sp spreading culture and knowledge and science all over the territory. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. I, uh I want to say two things uh, um, and before we move on is uh, for those who, kn who know you, uh, it's obvious that uh, when you're an outstanding professor, one day you are an outstanding professor, always obviously you haven't lost any of your uh, talents uh, as a lecturer. 
I want also to insist that we have not been briefing this man. He's been telling you these things about universities and Europe, and he's been pushing all these buttons unknowingly. Um, and, and you've really mentioned a lot of the things that we discussed within CIVIS uh, in a very strategic way. So um, if you ever uh, get tired of Belgian politics, we have a job for you at CIVIS anytime you like. Uh, so let's start now with the responses, if, if you like, uh, again, in very open format. And we will start with one of the students, uh, Julia Tiluetes, if you like. Uh, you get the first response. You can, st you can stay where you are if you grab the microphone. Uh, Anton, maybe the microphone is with you. I know you have to share the microphone. I'm sorry about that. So can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, thank you so much. It was very, very interesting. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions. So, uh, but they're more like open questions, I think, for, for everyone. Uh, because this morning, I'm in the student council, and this morning we really tackled uh, student mobility. And I think we all agree that it's a great chance for every student to be able to spend a semester abroad, even a year abroad. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's a problem, uh, as you said, like a, a bit rural area is becoming a bit depopulated. So how do you manage both? Like, um, I know it's a large question, but how do you keep the cities for its citizens and how do you allow small and more rural areas to grow, and at the same time, you uh, make it possible for students and for professors and people who investigate to go to those cities. How do you not lose the perspective of the city um, within all that? And then also, how do you make integration available for every student? Because I think every student here, and we were talking about it this morning, only the student council, and then with the CVS ambassadors as well, um, we are eager to go out there. But we're not always capable of doing it, not only financially, which of course is a problem, but also people who have um, family issues or people that have disabilities. Um, how do you make it... How do you make that integration that we all want and that more and more it's required, even in internships, available for everyone? Should I? Oh, okay. <laughs> and so now, well, thank you for your questions and, and reflections. I'm happy that uh, the few thoughts I, I presented converge with, with your uh, own uh, reflections. On, on the first question, I think... In, in David Goodhart's book, or in, in the studies made by Jacques Lévy, they do not contrast rural areas on the one hand and urban areas. It's more urban and suburban, or semi-urban. Because rural areas is, is another world, so to say, in, in most countries. Completely different and not necessarily... Uh, the people who have chosen to live in the countries in, in, in a rural area or in the countryside or do not, do not feel this as a relegation. It's a choice. And they normally are happy with, with that choice. But most of the people who simply cannot afford uh, an urban uh, center today because, uh, because the price of the apartments are much too high, because, uh, but, but still needs to, to go and work there because the concentration of the jobs are there, are living in this permanent commuting between the small city or the, or the periphery and, and, the, and the city center and leaving the contrast and feeling that their part of the territory is abandoned by, by the state, by the community, by, 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 by culture, by, by everything. So I think public policies in general should, should be very careful to make sure that we, through the choices that we make, uh, guarantee some kind of balanced development of, of the territory instead of... Um, instead of saying people just need to move, but also people can stay where they are, and not everybody can move, as, as, as you mentioned, for physical or financial reasons. So we should also make sure that we guarantee the development of, uh, of all the public infrastructures that the people need to, to have a happy and, and rich life where they live. Although it's not easy, of course, because it, it implies decentralizing a number of, uh, of inst institutions or infrastructures. But as far as universities are, are concerned, I think 
this is a reflection that universities should, should also have. In most big European uh, cities, you, France was maybe the, the most, uh, the clearest example. In the 19, until the 1950s, all European universities were in the urban cores. Then they all moved to the peripheries in the 1960s and built American-like campuses uh, a bit further from, from, from the center and rebuilt some kind of city around the city. And then most of them tried to not fully move back to the city center, but at least to have a place there. And some of them now realize that they also have to have sort of a, uh, part of the structures in smaller or most remote parts of the territory. And I think slowly and gradually with this history of uh, constant movement, uh, rediscovering so, some parts of the territory which had been abandoned or, or nearly abandoned. And this for the profit of the, uh, of, of the students and, and, and of the territories, of course. Now, I'm not saying that people do, do not need to move. I mean, it's uh, leaving its own city in small s and going to a bigger city is a wonderful experience of freedom and emancipation and discovery of something else, which must remain, of course, uh, a personal experience that as many people as possible uh, can have, but uh, not at the expense of uh, of the, the, the regions that they have left, and not with, as a consequence, a very deep socio-economic and nowadays also cultural and political polarization. Thank you. Julia, do you want to, do you want to make another remark or another question? You, you're allowed to follow up if you like. If you don't, then you can please give back the, the microphone to um, Anton Muscatelli for his response. Well, bon bonsoir, merci, Francois. Je suis ravi d'être ici à, à Bruxelles. And thank you, Paul, for those uh, uh, wonderful remarks, which actually are very, very rich indeed. And, and they made me think about uh, what I might say in response. Um, I should explain I'm an economist by background, so many of the things that Paul was talking about are, are actually quite familiar to me, and he's absolutely right. Um, and David Goodhart's book became very famous because he did catch that moment and that debate around Brexit in, in, in the UK. Um, let me make two or three mar remarks, one or two around the analysis that Paul presented, because I think it's really, really important to, to see how that negative dynamic that he described could happen, uh, which divides societies around issues like uh, integration, like trade, could perhaps be reversed if we, if we get things right. And then perhaps say, I might say a bit about what my university is trying to do as, just, as an example, and there are many examples, I'm sure, around the service network. So the point that globalization has left many people behind in the more advanced economies is absolutely true. You look at uh, the work of uh, Branko Milanovic, who's an economist who's analyzed how integration of trade across the whole world has impacted on different parts of the uh, global population. It's lifted a huge number of people out of poverty in emerging economies. At the very top, it's made some people very, very rich. But it's in the middle, and it's that middle in terms of the global distribution of income, which actually is the poorer part of the advanced economies that Paul was talking about. Uh, they have tended to find their income stagnating, or they've become actually poorer in some cases. And, and this is absolutely true, and it's, it's a really interesting thing, because economic analysis would, would have suggested the opposite, that actually trade was all about win-win and nobody lost. But in fact, uh, as econo economists will tell you, over the last 30 years, we have reevaluated how trade works. There are much more heterogeneous effects. There are jobs which are lost in some economies as a result of integration and trade, particularly, which then uh, mean that people have to retrain. And it's difficult. It genuinely is difficult, which means that you have these distributional effects, which, which are at the heart of the rebellion against greater integration. Um, however, there, there, there are also some countervailing factors, which I think are really important. I mean, Paul, you asked why this was Scotland different. Scotland was different, not because Scotland has any different distribution of income or different sort of urban, suburban uh, sort of uh, distributional differences from some of the northern English cities. It was different because all of the political parties in Scotland, including the Conservative Party, which was pro-Brexit, took a pro-European stance. And they persuaded, they showed leadership, and they persuaded people that actually 
yes, of course, there are potential negative impacts from any integration through trade, but by designing that integration properly, we can actually do, we can all benefit. And, and those parties managed to get a united line, and therefore Scotland, every single electoral district in Scotland voted to remain in the EU. And your chart was completely blue. So it shows you that actually institution and leadership can make a difference. It can also polarize, but it can bring people together. And in the US, we've seen polarization. In the UK, we've seen polarization. But actually, politicians can play a big role, and institutions can play a big role. So that takes me to my remarks about what we can do as institutions, because we, as you said, we are hugely powerful institutions. I look at my own uh, university, very similar size to ULB and Madrid and others. We were comparing notes. We are about 34,000 students. Our total income is about 700 million pounds. Uh, but our total economic impact on Scotland as a whole, on the UK as a whole, not just Scotland, is about 4.4 billion. But it's below that, those raw economic figures that we make a real difference, is what impact we can make to the distributional issues that we were hearing about. So I'm very proud, for instance, that our university works very hard to widen access to uh, higher education to really try to create social mobility. About 16% of our students at Glasgow come from the poorest 20% of the socioeconomic districts in Scotland. And for them, they are coming to one of the very best universities in the world. They're not just coming to any university. And we, we, we want them to succeed. And we work very hard to bring them in to succeed. Uh, one of the things we've done recently with the University of Edinburgh, for instance, is to go even further into the education system. We've set up centers that will take in uh, children and families from the age of seven to tell them about universities, not just about universities, actually about any higher education, whether it's further education, vocational or academic education. It's about trying to shift the dial on that deprivation that Paul was talking about, which is a major dividing factor in our societies. And our universities can do things like that because it is important that we do, otherwise we will be, become part of that division. We can also make a huge impact uh, in terms of our local economy, making sure that we invest. You know, one of the things, we're based as a university in the most affluent part of Glasgow, simply by per chance, simply because of we moved there in the 19th century. We're, we're a medieval university, actually. We are part of that medieval university movement. We're founded in 1451. But in 1870, we moved to what became the wealthier part of the city. But we're now creating outposts in terms of our industrial innovation districts and our educational outposts, which are in the poorer parts of Glasgow. Because unless we do that, we will not be seen as a university of the city and that belongs to the city. So for me, I think networks like Civis can make a huge difference because we can share good practice. And beyond the socioeconomic divisions that Paul was talking about, of course, we now face even bigger challenges, climate change, which could actually create even more divisions than trade uh, in terms of uh, the distributional consequences. So unless we play a major role in that, and we can do that as part of this network, um, I think we, we need to be the institutions that draw people together, not that split people apart. And, I do think, uh, and it'd be interesting to hear uh, colleagues speak about this, because I think there are huge areas where we can work together. But I mean, I, don't, I want my university to be a global university, but there is no conflict between being global and local. Unless we are local, frankly, uh, we, you know, we're not a civic university. And I want the poorest uh, people in, in Scotland to be able to come to one of the best universities in the world, because actually that's a huge advantage. Again. That is what a civic role is about. So um, it'd be interesting, Paul, to s perhaps to push you around areas like, uh, you know, areas like climate change, which are going to actually cause more disintegrating forces. Where do you think again, you know, what universities like the Civis Alliance can do in this in this sphere? That's a big, big issue. Uh, maybe first two reflections on, on think. I think universities can also do to uh, to uh, go to avoid that kind of uh, deep polarization. One is to decide some kind of decentralization. In France, for example, Sciences Po, uh, the big Institut d'études politiques de Paris, was in Paris, had been in Paris from the, the, the end of the 19th century until the 1950s, and sometimes in the 1950s, some, uh, 1960s, they start to build Sciences Po in Strasbourg, in Marseille, in Bordeaux, in Lille, and so on and so forth. 
It remained in metropolitan areas, but it, it was not Paris-centered, and for many people who had probably never accessed Sciences Po Paris, they could access Sciences Po nevertheless, and the quality of some of those uh, went even beyond the quality of Sciences Po Paris in terms of teaching and also in terms of research. And then one of the presidents of Sciences Po realized at some point that, well, it gets better, but even in Lille or in Strasbourg or in Bordeaux, we have the sense of the bourgeoisie, because to access Sciences Po, you have to pass an exam, to have a concours, a French-style concours. And so he decided to recruit students from the suburbs of Paris without concours, to make a sort of positive affirmative action, as you say in English, or positive discrimination, as we say in French. And it created an incredible discussion within, I, I was, I, I taught at Sciences Po at that time, and incredible discussions everywhere, saying, well, this is discrimination, this goes against Republican equality, and so on and so forth. And those students coming from the suburbs, went from the banlieue, it's even worse than the suburbs, in, uh, in, in Paris, Sciences Po, the first time, they were so, so shy, and so on and so forth. But I had some of, of those students in, in my course, and they succeeded, and, and, and the president could demonstrate that, yes, sometimes you need to do that to build equality, and you need to, you need to use affirmative action to, to build that kind of, of equality. So those are examples which show that there are um, answers to that kind, of, to that kind of, uh, of problems. Climate transition is, of course, certainly the biggest, biggest issue of our time, and it will certainly destroy lots of, uh, economies, lots of companies and, and lots of jobs, and we have to... We should anticipate that, and we should be prepared to uh, to uh, know what we will do against it. And universities have sadly a very important role in in this respect, because all studies of uh, international labor organization, for example, show that uh, the, the economy after the climate transition or during the climate transition, after ten years or so, should produce more jobs than we have today, because the job intensity of for example, renewable energy is higher than gas or oil or, or even nuclear uh, energy. The job intensity of uh, green tourism is more important than the job intensity of mass tourism. The same for food, the same for many, many other issues. So yes, it can create more jobs, but the moment of the transition is always a very difficult moment. And the actors not always have an, an idea of how they should change, in which di direction they should go. And there, of course, universities with their research centers, with their, uh, with their uh, spin -off, uh, support to spin-off and, and support and, and links with the companies have a very important role role to play. Universities in Europe were the major driver of the construction of the European biotech uh, sector, which, was, which did not exist 30 years ago. We have the, some big pharma, but not, not a real biotech sector as we have it today. And it is thanks to research on the one hand, to the role of spin-offs and cooperation between, uh, between universities and uh, people who wanted to, uh, to create new companies in the field that we managed to create that sector. If, that's, if this was possible for that sector, it must be possible for lots of sectors that, will, that should emerge from, from, from the climate transition. Maybe, may, may I ask a question to the director? Oh. Of yeah, Another sure. question. <laughs> Some of my British friends, even progressive friends, sometimes told me one of the only good things that Margaret Thatcher did was integrating universities and what were called at the time the polytechnics or the other elements of the, of the higher education. Others do not agree and say that it's a purely formal integration. In fact, there is no real cooperation between the different components of, the, of this world. And I would be pleased to have your opinion on this. Thank you. That's a very good question. And unfortunately, there isn't a simple answer. Um, what has happened over time is actually that uh, most of the universities that have existed before 1992, before that happened, uh, that separation ended, uh, have tended to remain the stronger ones if you look at research. However, what these post-92 universities have done is to, be, to enter those part of, the, uh, of training and skills formation that universities that were existed before 92 didn't go into. I think if I had, you know, so, so that's an advantage. So you're absolutely right. It's created an increase in higher education and it has widened access to higher education. The difficulties perhaps has created a tendency, at least for a, for a few years, perhaps uh, it may change now actually, but for about 20, 25 years has created a tendency for uh, universities to become more the same rather than trying to differentiate each other depending on, on... Now, I think that is changing. I think universities are now, uh, especially those that were created after 1992, are recognizing that they have a very specific mission. I think 
I wanted to pick up another point you made, which is really important. I think we've seen a, a, some a pretty intense competition in UK higher education since 1992, especially since 97, when funding increased again. I think we should see more col collaboration now because, frankly, it's collaboration not only between universities, but actually between universities and further education colleges and schools that will make a real difference in these big societal challenges you mentioned. So I'm a bit more optimistic, but I don't think there is a, you know, I, I, I think overall it's been a benefit, but uh, there has been also a tendency for universities to try and occupy very similar ground, and that's been perhaps a bit of a negative. I think differentiation is good, actually, because um, students benefit. Thank you. This is uh, <laughs> increasing in intensity. You didn't, you didn't realize you'd be interviewed when you, when you came here. And <laughs> Thank you. That, that's really interesting. You guys should write a book together. Okay, let's move on now to uh, our third respondent. I will, uh, I will ask uh, uh, Lucas Portugales to um, thank respond. You. And thank you for that presentation, which was very precious, because maybe not everyone here or following us online had all the opportunity and the challenges that are given to us uh, with CIVIS. Um, and it was really well shown in the presentation. I think one of the greatest opportunities right now is, of course, the opportunity to make people meet uh, in a time where we see a far-right uh, policies growing all around Europe. Uh, one of the main threats would be, of course, as Julia said before, to just allow people that were already people that moved because they had the, the possibility to do it, because they had the money to do it, etc those kind of people who could still move around and the people that could not afford it would still be um, blocked at the university or at the, at the city. It might create a, a feeling of frustration and divide us more, I believe. That's something we need to be very attentive of in the future. If you have any opinion on that. I, I just agree with you. So Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but I, I don't know if you have a more specific uh, question on, on this. Maybe... Uh, one of another challenge would be the how to find a common ground of governance and for students especially as like us how to find a place uh, to create to participate in the club in the creation of such big project as uh, CIVIS on different level because of course we have the governance of your university which is different from one city to another but then we also have to talk with the politics and the European Commission. That's a good question, and it's been a very, very long and very often heated discussion in uh, in this university too. In the moment of 1968, when we introduced a student participation, this university one was one of the most innovative city in in this respect, and the other ones remained very prudent or even very uh, negative uh, in reaction to that. But uh, it proved very efficient uh, in the long run, contrary to all the critiques uh, that were raised at the time. And I think nowadays. It would be nearly impossible. I don't know in, in, in many other uh, countries how, how it works in, in those countries, but uh, I, I, I could not imagine here in Belgium at least uh, the governance of the university without uh, a clear role and an important role and not just consultation or not just a, a pure formal role for, for students. Uh, in, in the governance of the university itself and its long-term and strategic choices, but also in its everyday life. And uh, uh, the COVID, for example, um, has been a, a very tough moment for everyone, but suddenly for students. And I think from what I've heard here at ULB, I don't know, we can't talk about other universities, but I'm still a little bit a professor here. So I've had contacts with my students and most students said, well, we, we, were, we were involved in the reflection on how we could keep teaching and keep studying and keep organizing exams and that kind of things uh, during uh, that period. Maybe maybe we should we could have been further. And if uh, the public authorities had allowed it, and I regret they didn't, I tried and tried to push in this direction, but uh, I think campuses and universities could have been very innovative places for the reflection on how we use the mask and how we used CSTU, as we call it, the COVID, COVID safe ticket, on how uh, on how vaccination campaign can be organized and how students can themselves uh, play a role in the implementation of the measures that need to be taken in, in, in the case of pandemics, which is also a way of showing that we take them seriously and that they can come with inputs and they can they can so improve the governance of the university, including in times of uh, in times of crisis. I was on the phone with the 
with the mayor of Liège when I arrived here. And he said he was very angry because the students had worked hours and hours and hours to organize what in Belgium we call the Gardaï. The Gada is basically is, uh, drinking a lot of beer in a very little amount of time and, 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 and singing and dancing and many other things. And it's very important, of course, in the life of, of the students. And they've, but very seriously, had worked the authorities of the University of Liège, the city and the, the students to see, well, given the constraints, how can we maintain the spirit of the Gada and how can we organize it? And it's been a very creative, uh, they all told me, a process and then the government might decide that it will be forbidden anyway, which is very disappointing when the students have uh, in, in that kind of element, and I, I'm not reducing the students to the Gandai and to the party and that kind of things, but it's a good example of uh, uh, in this period of crisis uh, how students can, can contribute to improving the governance of, uh, of the university, the same for the organization as a student, and campaign for what we call the visite de copie. We wanted to see the exams, we wanted, and we wanted the professors to explain why we had failed. So we wanted the uh, we wanted the motivation of the decision uh, of the of, of the, the professor who had decided that we, we had failed or not, and it was a long struggle. Long struggle in the end, we won, and uh, we, as students, took part in the uh, implementation of that decision and in a better dialogue between the students and the teachers. And many teachers were very reluctant uh, at the origin, also. But then in the end, they say, well, it creates a dialogue between the students and. Uh, if a student understands why he fails, he, his chances to succeed next time will, will be higher. And it can also be interesting for, for the students. We also introduced, uh, also struggled for what we call the avis pédagogique, the fact that the students could uh, make an evaluation of, uh, of, of the teachers. And uh, as a teacher, then I say, well, why, why did I fight for this when I was a student? But, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I found it very interesting because uh, you, you almost also uh, need to have a feedback and to improve your teachings and to, to get those critiques can, can be, uh, and remarks and suggestions can be uh, very interesting. So if it works at the level of one university, I don't see any reason reason why it wouldn't work at the level of a broader uh, governance and network of, uh, of universities. And I fully agree with you that this should be also in terms of uh, the spirit of the, of, the whole, uh, of the whole thing, of the whole network, uh, one of its um, building blocks. Talking about spirit, uh, CVS is one university alliance among others. What do you think you showed the map of CVS makes CVS different from the other? Or what in what civics should invest in the future to make a difference between the other? Well, what I find very interesting is this uh, geographical balance and the fact that we have uh, very different universities. I, I know most of them, I, uh, I've been to most of them, they're, they're all very interesting and uh, they're all very prestigious, strong universities, but, uh, but at the same time it's not a kind of uh, European-like Ivy League of very privileged universities who decide to work among themselves and not to open themselves. The fact of being north and south and east and west and have a medium size, I would rather big universities in, in, if, if we compare to the, to the average, uh, but nevertheless uh, medium-sized, I think is, is very interesting. I would only recommend if there's another stage to maybe open to smaller universities or to more remote or more peripheral universities so as to, uh, to integrate the experiences of, uh, of different kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of universities, research and, and teachings. Um, for the record, this university has shifted from evaluating the teachers to evaluating the teaching, uh, which doesn't seem like much of a difference, but it is actually, I think, um, a significant difference. Thank you for that. So I will now give the floor to Amaya Mendikoete. I'm, I'm trying to improve my Basque uh, pronunciation. Every time I pronounce your name, I'm, I'm sure I'll get it eventually. Go ahead, Amaya. Don't worry, you're forgiven. Um, uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, talk. And um, I'd like to comment on this um, gap between the somewheres and the anywheres. And I was wondering where universities stand in that divide. And um, because we've been talking about bridging the gap and the, the role that universities play in bridging the gap between these two worlds, in a way. But if you think about where universities stand, they actually stand with the somewheres rather than the anywheres. And if you, if you look, for instance, at the voting for Brexit or the voting for the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States, um, it's, it's mostly university graduates that have voted for 
or most university graduates voted for Remain in the case of Brexit, or um, for uh, Biden uh, in the in the um, U.S. elections. So I was wondering how we can actually bridge that gap when we're actually part of the somewheres rather than the anywheres. And um, I was also reminded of um, a book I've um, read recently by Michael Sandel, The Tyranny of Merit. And he reaches a very similar conclusion to, to um, the one you mentioned, that um, in a way, uh, populism is the result of the fact that globalization has left people behind, and that um, uh, success is kind of um, identified with, with wealth now. So uh, if you also think of universities and the role that universities play in society, they are also part of that social and economic situation. I mean, graduates end up in more highly paid jobs as well. So um, uh, they, they, they seem to be contributing to the system rather than, than um, getting rid of it. So um, possibly, I mean, you can, you, you, you can work through um, civic engagement, which is, um, is become an important mission of universities. Um, but I was wondering whether that was actually enough. So, when you look at the history of universities, they've, they've adapted to the times. And um, in the 19th and the 20th century, they, they transformed to meet the needs of the emerging industrial societies. And now they seem to be serving the needs of a global um, digital or knowledge economy. So, um, this is why I was mentioning at the beginning, they, they kind of fit in more with that, that side of the divide rather than the other. So, well, it's, it's just um, um, a comment which is based on the, what's happened to universities throughout history that they mostly serve the elites rather than the kind of poor side of society. And things are changing a lot, at least in Spain, and at least in the Madrid region where, where my university is. In the Madrid region, there are six public universities, six state universities, and 13 private um, universities. And it's becoming tougher and tougher to get into a state university because of the grades you need for highly prestigious degrees. So what's happening is like, uh, it's a paradox in a way that um, students who've been to private schools um, have find, find it easier to access or uh, positions in state universities, while those who can't make it because of the grades end up in the much more expensive private universities. So you have a paradox there between what state universities should be serving and what they're actually doing in a way that contrasts with what um, Anton said about uh, Glasgow and catering for students in the poorest part of Scotland. Just a comment. I don't know mm -hmm. whether you'd like to comment on it. Well, yes. Uh, f first, I, I don't think universities are responsible for the situation, but they're, they're part of it. Whether they like it or not, they're part of it. They're an actor in the, in, and they're a member of that story, if I, if I may say. So they need to be aware of it and to see what they can do. And there actually are two kinds of divisions. The first one is the division between the people who will go to university and those who will never go to university, which two, one or two generations ago was not so so important in the society. And as David Goodhart very convincingly shows, there were only about 5% of um, at, at my, my father's generation, there was only 5% of people going to, to university in the society. So 95% of the people did not go to university. So it was not humiliating not to go to university. But when you're in a society where 40% of the population goes to university of higher education, well, not being part of that 40 person, you're not in the 95 one, you're in the 60 one, which is already much smaller. And so you feel that you're not in the, in this, it's nearly a majority, it's, it's nearly 50-50, and you're in the right side of the 50-50, something that can be humiliating. 
this is not the responsibility of the universities. This is mainly the responsibility of the companies, I think, because the in, in, in the past, uh, an 18 year, 18 year old student, uh, young guy could, could find a job in a company. He had no training, he had no skills, but the company would, would, would train him and he would get skills in the company. Still, if, if you if you are uh, if you don't have skills and and you go t you find a job you will usually remain at the level where where you entered uh, that company. Internal mobility in those companies has become very rare. Why? Because they externalize the cost of formation to to the society and say, I want the people ready to work. And if I want someone who who is low low skill, I will take him take him like that. But I will never invest in, in his training and in development of his skills. And if, in if, if I want someone, someone who is high-skilled, I, I want him high-skilled and ready, and I'm prepared to pay for that. But I don't want to pay for, 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 the, uh, for the training. That's, that's the first problem. The second one it depends from one country to the other one. But the, the Michael Sandel, the American philosopher's last book, was also very interesting about those universities, and he calls it in, in French, it's la tyrannie du mérite. I don't know if it's the tyranny of merit, or meritocracy in, uh, in, 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 in English. And he shows, but we, there again with data, that the, the, the hierarchy between universities has become, it's always been very important in the US. Of course, being in Harvard or in Yale or in Princeton is not the same as being in uh, Mozilla, higher college, all that kind of things. But, um, but it's become, becoming ever more important. Having the Harvard or the Yale or Princeton name on your diploma has, has, has become even more important than 30 years ago or than 50 years ago. And people pay an incredible amount of money to make sure that their kids will go to the right faculty and that kind of things. And this is certainly the case in Britain too, to a wide extent. I can speak under your control. This is certainly the case in France too, where the distinction between high schools uh, Sciences Po, uh, HEC, and that kind of things, and universities, which are a bit down, uh, high, high schools, has always been there, has always been part of the of the landscape. And there, we as public authorities have a role to play because we we have instruments of regulation, at least in in countries where uh, the public authorities do play a very important role in the in the financial support of those of those studies. We have a role to play to make sure that uh, the, that those kind of hierarchies can cannot be uh, cannot be consolidated over time, and that people who go to one college uh, get a chance to, if they're good, of course, they need to be good. I mean, <laughs> there's, a, there's always a limit. I mean, the student needs to study, needs to work. Uh, you, you, you have to ha give him all the chances, but he also has his own responsibility, of course, in, in this. But if, if he works and studies, he should get a chance to, uh, to, to go to one of those uh, places where he can find uh, the kind of training that, uh, that he needs. And Organizing the, the, and making that mobility possible and depending only on the capacity of the students and not the financial capacity of its parents uh, is something I think which is also very important. He actually argues, uh, talking about Michael Sandel, that um, the merit in a way um, cannot be the answer in the sense that we don't all have equal opportunities. We don't start from the same level, in a way. So, yeah, it's, it's true that they enter those universities on the basis of merit, but they don't start from the same um, stand, actually. Thank you very much. I, I have a small question of my own before we'll ask the audience if there there is dark questions in the audience. Um, when, when you started talking about the somewheres and the anywheres, I, I, immediately it sprang to mind that this uh, distinction could be transposed, at least in, conceptually, to student mobility. We know, and then student mobility is really important to, uh, to civis, and Julia mentioned it. There are many students who don't do student mobility because they can't, they would like, and, and you know, we've said how we try to identify the obstacles, or second choice, third choice, it was obvious they just wanted to go anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to go to Spain. If that doesn't work, I'll go to Finland. If that doesn't work, I'll go to, um, uh, to Romania. And they just wanted to go away and travel. So in a way, they would be an anywhere. Uh, but does that mean that students who are not interested in mobility could be something like the somewheres? Uh, do you think this, this, there's, a, there's, a, there's um, a chance to develop a kind of a sociology of academic mobility? Because that goes for colleagues too. You and I know that some colleagues are more keen on traveling and collaborating with other uh, countries than others. And so can this be in any way transposed to universities? Well, I don't have enough data to give a, to give a clear response to answer to that, to that question. I think 
it, it may be due in some case to family reasons. You just don't want to move because you have a friend or partner and children, and and well, they cannot move, so you so you don't move and you make the choice. It can be due to financial reasons. Sometimes it's too expensive, and even with Erasmus, even with the support of the Erasmus program, for cannot not if uh, I'm talking about those who just say eh, not interested. I'm not interested. Well, if they're not interested, they're not interested. I mean, it's their freedom. But what does, I mean, what does that say about them? I mean, Anton will tell you that... Um, Honestly, I don't no, know. I'm, I'm, no, I, notoriously, I British students are... There's a lower proportion of students who are trying to go on mobility than in other countries. I mean, I'm sure there are some studies uh, trying to explain that, but I wonder what, what that means. Oh. Microphone. We are running short on microphones. Thank you very much. Well, it's a yes, and there are multiple factors, I think. Uh, some of it is to do with different socioeconomic groups. We generally find that students from poorer backgrounds don't want to go away for full semester. They have jobs, they have uh, yeah, uh, also. caring commitments, etc. However, uh, I think in the UK case, often it's been a linguistic barrier as well. Uh, and it's not because there aren't many European countries that teach in English. It's the, it's the, it, it creates a cultural barrier. And, and actually, that's been very significant, which is one of the reasons, actually, where we really feel that uh, we want to strengthen our European side, uh, our European links post Brexit, because, to my mind, actually, that lack of multilingualism is a real problem in the, uh, for the UK student. There's a huge advantage in, in multilingualism. It's part of one of those skills that are that. So, but you're right; it's difficult to persuade them to do that, um, and it's uh, one way, of course. We, one. Uh, there's not many silver linings to this pandemic. One silver lining to the pandemic is that we are learning to collaborate more and to bring students together in teams virtually as well. So it's not the same as the cultural uh, coming together that you can achieve through travel, but actually we can produce a little bit of, of, of that through, um, through these virtual uh, engagements um, and exchanges that we can do. So, but it's a complex, it's a, it's a complex area. Thank you. Well, of course, Civis will fix all that. So we now have a few minutes to, uh, to see if there's any question or comment in the audience. We are equipped with a poll to bring a microphone to you wherever you are uh, without too much contortion. Any question or comment? Don't be shy. Rachel, if the microphone is coming your way. There, to the left. I'm sorry I made you run from the other, the other side of the auditorium. Um, but, well, firstly, um, huge thanks to Paul and, and all of the speakers. I found that a really uh, interesting and insightful session. And actually, the question I had um, segues in beautifully to what um, my own vice chancellor has just said around virtual engagement. And, and the question really is, is a kind of digital transformation across society exacerbating the differences between the somewheres and the anywheres, or actually over time will those differences diminish as people have access to technology and different ways of engaging? And I just, I, I guess it's a question for Paul specifically, but for others to comment on as well. You know, is the kind of digital transformation that we're seeing within our own sector, but across you know, society more, more broadly, something that will be to the benefit of some of the challenges that you've highlighted in your presentation, or actually something that will exacerbate them even further? Yeah, it's always hard to tell, but I, I would rather say that it reduces the gap, and it, it should rather be seen as an opportunity than, than as a threat, at least in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, education in, in general. I would not say the same for politics, but that's another, that's another debate. Uh, but yes, for education, I'm, I'm always impressed to see people who've learned lots of things by themselves. I said, how do you, where, where have you learned that? Well, on, on the internet, on YouTube. I, I found tutos and that kind of things. And this is an incredible democratization of, uh, of, of knowledge and self-production also of knowledge and new practices. 
of uh, how people teach and how they, they, they study together. I remember one of my daughters in, on, on the table of the kitchen, and she was with, with her syllabus studying, and she, she was on Facebook at the same time. And I told her, but please do study, keep that Facebook. I do study with Facebook. I'm talking with Elena. We're sharing the answer on question two. So she used it as a sort of a complementary element to, and I think that this dialogue between those students, I, I feel like when I, when I talk with my students, they have much more cooperation, much more dialogue than, than my generation did have. And this is to a large extent due to uh, the fact that they managed to use those instruments as pedagogical, uh, as pedagogical instruments. I also experienced that last year we were in confined here in Brussels like, like everywhere. And so we had to teach through teams. First, we, we said that we are an orange code, so it would be some kind of organization like tonight. Uh, but then we said, well, no, it's full, so we have to teach via Teams, which for the teacher is a nightmare, because you, you talk to a screen uh, with no faces on the screen and just the, just the, the circles and, and, and the names of the students, and then we ask them to open a little bit. And so we, with my colleague Justine Lacroix, we tried to reorganize the, the course, which is usually with a quite big uh, group of students, 250 or so, and say, well, we will organize what we call the reversed class. So we send them the text, we ask them to work on it, and then we organize the debate. We, we tried that in real, in the auditorium. It didn't work really well, because we, when you have 250 students, honestly, dialogue with the students is very difficult. But it worked better on Teams than, than, than in a real auditorium. Why? I can't tell. Maybe students who are a bit shy to take the floor in a big, uh, in a big, to talk before their screen. Many of them send comments on the chats. I find that also very interesting. I was teaching, and so the students say, "Well, I have a question on this and that." They would usually never dare uh, asking during the course, but there on the chat is very easy. So there again, maybe it it breaks or it reduces barriers in, and, and it can improve the dialogue between the student and, and the teachers and between the students themselves. So I'm, I'm rather in favor of uh, using all the capacities and instruments of this uh, digital uh, generation while, of course, not destroying what is the root of, uh, of, our, uh, of our job, which is uh, the teaching and having direct contact with the students. A complete digitalization would be a nightmare, but uh, as a complement, I think it can be very useful. Wait until you see Civis Digital Campus. <laughs> Other question or comment? I know we are just about, uh, we are actually over time, but uh, it's such a, such a treat <laughs> to actually have a live audience. And uh, this is like the only dissemination event uh, that we could, uh, we could maintain. So I'm very grateful to, for to Paul Magnet uh, and to the four who accepted to be his respondent. Very grateful to those of you who uh, came all the way to, um, to campus to spend this hour with us. Grateful to um, the whole team which made this happen technically. Uh, and so thank you very much to all. Thank you. I'm, I'm afraid, I'm sure you were told that the, the walking dinner, which was supposed to follow, uh, had to be cancelled for obvious reasons, but I promise you, we'll do that walking dinner one day. Uh, that's a promise. Thank you.